Now, our scripture reading this morning is from Revelation chapter 3, beginning with verse 14. Um, I borrowed Jerry's King, New King James Version so it'll match what's on your screen, but I would encourage you to go look it up in your own Bibles as well and follow along. Verse 14, we know what this is. This is the message to the church of Laodicea. John heard these words. He says, And to the angel of the church of Laodiceans write, These things, says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say, I am rich, having become wealthy and have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, that you may be rich, and white garments that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed. And anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him, and he with me. Him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Elder Wahlberg, have music? All right, I was thinking there would be a special music, but I guess not. It's not going to be me. <laughs> I'm not going to sing. <laughs> well, uh, good morning, everybody. God is good. He's good all the time. I was really happy for last night's meeting. The Lord really blessed that. And if you missed it, it's on the church's YouTube channel. And I posted it on my Facebook page uh, this morning. <laughs> And you never know where it will go. I mean, people will watch and people who are involved in social media. It's just amazing how God can multiply something over and over and over again. So I hope that he'll do that again with uh, this morning's message. Now, before we get into the topic from Revelation, let me just share a few things about our ministry, Whitehorse Media. Most of you know about us. Our website, whitehorsemedia.com, is just loaded with information uh, we have a lot of things that are free. We have links to social media. We have our YouTube channel. We have our Facebook uh, page. And we post a lot of things on there that are free. And people are really going there. We have an e-newsletter. And we have a Twitter account. I'm cur curious how many of you uh, do Twitter here. I'm just, let me see if any of you, a couple of you. So you know what it's like to tweet, right? tweet out, and tweeting basically is you're just sending out little messages, and I send out a lot of Bible verses, uh, the word of the Lord into the world, and who knows where it, where it will land. Uh, we, have a, we have a brand new, we're calling it uh, a, a, a series of 10-minute videos, because people's attention spans are getting shorter and shorter these days. So we're writing, I'm writing smaller books, <laughs> and we're doing videos now that are 10 minutes. So we have a new one coming out next week, and it's called 666 Explained in 10 Minutes. And it's, uh, the springboard is the stock market a couple weeks ago went down 666 points. Did you hear about that? And all kinds of speculation about that, so... Anyway, uh, you might be interested in that. We're going to do a whole series of these. And so if you go on our website and go to our YouTube channel and uh, subscribe, you'll get these automatically uh, for free, no, no cost involved. We also have another brand new little book called Making Sense of Deadly Disasters. And on the cover, there's a picture of a fire, a volcano, a hurricane, uh, fireballs, tornado, earthquake, 
and also a, a mass murderer. And I tell you, you know, these things that are happening in this world today are just so heartbreaking. What just happened in Florida uh, with all these, these uh, kids getting killed and others at a school. And I hate to say it, but we know that these things are going to be increasing. There's going to be a lot more. And when people go through tragedy and disaster and heartache, many times they are open to God. And so that's what this little book is about. I see in your bulletin you have a disaster relief program. And anyway, this is a, it's a very powerful little tool to explain why these things are happening, uh, to help people understand the great controversy, that God is a good God in the midst of all of these terrible things, and that really the ultimate foe is the devil, not the Lord. And it's a, it's a powerful witnessing tool. <laughs> We have another little book coming out called Hope for the Hopeless. Should be out in a couple of weeks. And this is based on, uh, I, some of you know about what happened to me last summer, my terrible summer and what the Lord taught me. And anyway, we hope that this book will encourage people that are struggling, people that uh, you know, don't know whether God still loves them, whether God still wants them in heaven. And some people fear that they've, come, they've gone too far They've committed the unpardonable sin and that there's no hope. And uh, Jesus wants to give us hope in these last days. The devil's trying to discourage us and Jesus is trying to give us hope and that hope is in him. So anyway, that'll be coming out uh, shortly and then we have another one we're working on, another little pocketbook called God's Last Call Before the End of the World that will be going right down through the three angels' messages one by one, very directly, very straightforward, telling people exactly what Babylon is, who the beast is, what the image is, what the mark is, what the commandments of God are, what the faith of Jesus is to be ready for the second coming. So that is, uh, that's coming. We're also... Just to you know, enlist, enlist your prayers, uh, we are excited that Whitehorse Media is coordinating. Uh, Pastor Ron, how many meetings are going on in the Philippines next month? There's uh, 10, 10 evangelistic meetings that we're gonna be helping to coordinate. About 30 people are going to the Philippines to hold meetings, and we're gonna be very much involved with that. So uh, pray, pray for that. And God's work is going on around the world in spite of the Sins that we see everywhere, God's work is slowly going forward. Isn't that right? And it's going to end with a big burst, with a big bang, and we want to be part of that. So that's what uh, Whitehorse Media is all about, and that's what this church is about. Uh, also, Pastor Ron mentioned that a number of you have uh, inquired about Gilbert. You remember Gilbert Navarro, uh, our good friend Gilbert that has been here in this church many times with us when we've traveled. Uh, he and his wife have moved back to California. Kathy's uh, family, her parents are getting up there and they wanted to be closer to, to them. So anyway, if he was here, I'm sure he would greet you uh, as well. So with all of that, let's uh, open our Bibles to the book of Revelation. New light for Laodicea. How do you like that title? For Laodiceans. Have you ever had anybody come to you and say, I've got some new light for you? Well, uh, I, I believe God does have more light for us as a people. But of course, we need to be, you know, we need to test everything by the Bible and make sure it really is light, really light from Jesus. And I hope that uh, this morning, as we get into this topic, that you will be blessed and the light of Jesus will shine. The uh, Laodicean message is very, very powerful. It's got a lot of depth that we'll just take a look at as much as we can in the time that we have uh, this morning. So let's pray. Last night we, we knelt, or I knelt, and some of you knelt. I wanna kneel again and just pray for God's blessing. So let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, Father, you know what's happening in your world and I, I can just imagine that the holy angels are on the edge of, uh, of their, their seats, so to speak, as they look down at what's happening in this world and they know that it won't be long until Jesus comes. 
and sin is abolished. And Lord, you're trying to get a people ready for the big day. That's what our movement is all about, helping people to get ready. And we pray that you will bless uh, this presentation this morning, this talk from the Bible. Lord, please help me to share your word faithfully. May the Holy Spirit speak to our hearts. And Lord, we all need revival. We need a reviving in our hearts of your message and of your power and of your grace and of your love. And so we pray for a big blessing uh, this morning. And as this talk is recorded, may it go out to uh, searching hearts around the world. We pray in Jesus, Jesus Christ's holy name. Amen. Amen. All right. Last night, we took, took a look at Revelation chapter 14. We talked about the three angels' messages. We talked about uh, the judgment. And I mentioned last night that in, in Revelation, there are two major judgments that take place. One of them is in Revelation 14, verse 7, that tells us that we're now living in the hour of, of God's judgment. And then uh, we also looked last night that there's another judgment, a big judgment in Revelation chapter 20, which we call the great white throne judgment, which is the judgment of the, the whole world ultimately that is lost or, or the lost at the end of the thousand years, and they stand before God. <clears throat> solemn, very solemn. We looked at that last night. Two judgments. It's also true when you read Revelation <clears throat> that there are two major end time final messages. The first one is the three angels <clears throat> from chapter 14, and that message goes out to the whole world, which we looked at some of that last night. And there's another message, <clears throat> which is in Revelation chapter 3, verses 14 to 22. <clears throat> And as I've pondered this and studied this carefully, I've concluded that the three angels' messages go to the world, but the message in Revelation chapter 3 is Jesus' message to the church. And the reason why Jesus gives a message to the church is to prepare the church to effectively give his message to the world. The three angels' messages are big messages. They talk about Babylon. They talk about the beast, the image of the beast, the mark of the beast, and a lot of big subjects. And uh, in order for us to go out and give that message effectively, we need some heart preparation. Does that make sense? We need the Lord to, uh, to prepare us so we can do the right thing and we can give the right message and we can say it in the right way. Say the message in the right way. <clears throat> so uh, that's what the Laodicean message is about and that's what we're gonna be reading shortly. Before I do, I wanna share just a few sentences from a little book called Testimonies for the Church, Volume 1. There's a chapter here called The Laodicean Church. And on, you could read this whole chapter. It's very, very valuable. But on page 186, <clears throat> here's a few, a few sentences. Ellen White wrote this. I was shown that the testimony to the Laodiceans applies to God's people at the present time. And the reason it has not accomplished a greater work is because of the hardness of of their hearts. But God has given the message time to do its work. The heart must be purified from sins which have so long shut out Jesus. So that's what the Laodicean message is all about. It's about purifying us. And so ultimately, God's goal is that Jesus can fully dwell in our hearts. 
And then it says it is, it is designed to arouse the people of God, to discover to them their backslidings and to lead to zealous repentance that they may be favored with the presence of Jesus and be fitted for the loud cry of the third angel. See that? So if we're going to really give the third angel's message, <clears throat> we need the presence of Jesus in our hearts. And that's what the Laodicean message is all about. As this message affected the heart, it led to deep humility before God. Angels were sent in every direction to prepare unbelieving hearts for the truth. The cause of God began to rise. So you get this picture that as the Laodicean message, when, the, when this message we're going to be looking at this morning really starts doing its work, when it really gets down deep into our souls, and when the, when the angels see that, and the Lord sees that, the, that the Laodicean message is really working, then the angels are sent out to start preparing other people's hearts out there for the three angels' messages. You see that? So that's the sequence here. As we're getting ready, then God starts getting them ready to hear the third angel. The cause of God began to rise. Uh, one more sentence. If the counsel of the true witness had been fully heeded, God would have wrought for his people in greater power. And then it goes on and says, yet the Lord has still blessed his work. He's been blessing his church in many ways, but there's a lot more that we need. Yes. That was uh, First Testimonies, volume of the Testimonies, page 186. And there's a lot more there. You can read the whole chapter, but it just really impresses me that we really need the, the Laodicean message. This is uh, very much part of present truth for the end times. Very much as we get closer to the time of the loud cry and the mark of the beast and the final crisis, we desperately need the Laodicean message and to prepare us for what's coming. So let's look at this. Does that sound like a good introduction? Let's take a look at the word of God. Verse 14. Now the Laodicean message is the last message of the seven messages that Jesus gives to his church. When you read chapter two, chapter three, Jesus gives seven messages to his churches. And these represent, uh, not only there were literal churches back there in the days when this was given, but these messages also represent uh, periods of time throughout Christian history coming down to the last period. And so we're in the last period, and the Laodicean message especially applies to us. Verse 14, Jesus said, To the angel of the church of the Laodiceans, write. Does anybody know what the word Laodicea means, or Laodiceans? Laodiceans, it's amazing. Uh, you know, the Bible doesn't, doesn't waste words. When it uses terms and words, often they have deep meanings. And the word Laodicea means a people judged. A people judged during a judgment time, during the hour of judgment. To the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, these things says, and who's speaking here? These things says the amen. Now, the word amen, and I, I believe that's actually the last word at the end of the Bible. Let me just check that. When you go to Revelation 22, the very last word of the whole Bible is one word, Amen. It's kind of like the, you know, the, the finale. Uh, I, I believe sometimes people say it means, uh, so be it. <laughs> the last word. And Jesus calls himself, as he's giving the Laodicean message, each church he calls himself by different phrases. And this one he calls himself the Amen, which tells me, first of all, right out of the gate, 
that Jesus Christ himself is the last word. He's the last word. And, you know, these days, I don't think we've ever lived in a time when there's more confusion. We could probably uh, nickname the time in which we live the time of confusion, the age of confusion. There is confusion when it comes to uh, a lot of things happening uh, in the world. There's confusion about a lot of things that are happening even in the church. There's confusion when it comes to the news politics, uh, even, you know, the topic of health. Somebody will say, this is healthy, and then another study comes out and says, no, that's actually really bad for you. And I mean, there's just confusion everywhere, isn't there? We live in an age of confusion. Winds are blowing all around. And what impresses me is that in the midst of all this confusion, Jesus says that he is the last word. He's the amen. So we need to listen to him above everybody else. He is also the faithful and the true witness. Faithful and true witness. What Jesus says is the truth. And how much do we need truth today? Uh, I don't know about you, but I hate being confused. I've been confused in different times in the past, and God has just taught me that if I want to get out of my confusion, I've got to listen to Jesus and what he has to say. Amen. He will unravel our confusion and make things plain. He is the faithful and the true witness. And then it says, Jesus says, that he is the beginning of, he is the beginning of the creation of God. Now, this phrase, the beginning of the creation of God, does not mean that he was the first one who was created. It doesn't mean that. The beginning of the creation of God means that he's the one that did the creating. He's the author of creation. So the whole theory of evolution, Jesus just blows it apart and says, I'm the one who made everything. I'm the one who created this world. He's the author of this planet. He is the last word. He tells the truth. And this whole world came into existence from him. Now that's... Uh, you know, that's a lot of credibility, don't you think? How many of you have ever seen some product, when you turn it over, it says, made in China? <laughs> well, you know what? If you had a tag on you, it would say, made by Jesus. You ever thought about that? Jesus is our maker, and, and this is a concept that's been uh, you know, growing on me for a long time and just deepening uh, in our family. We have, uh, we have three dogs, three cats currently, and we have four fish in a fish tank, and they're pretty fish. They really are. They all have names, <laughs> and, uh, and a lot of times I'll go into our living room, and I'll, I'll get down on my knees maybe in the morning when my kids are still sleeping, and I'll, I'll spend time in prayer, and uh, I'll fold my hands. And a lot of times, I'll turn on the little light, and I'll look at the fish. And they're just so pretty, you know, and they're so relaxing. And it, it has just uh, impressed me that Jesus made those fish. When I fold my hands, you know, who made my hands? Jesus made my hands. Jesus made me. It's a, it's a truth that has been growing on me that I have been created by Jesus Christ. My dogs have been created by Jesus Christ. Our cats, the deer we see out in our backyard, the beautiful deer, although I don't like them when they get into my garden. <laughs> uh, you know, you look outside, you look at the, the trees. This is a beautiful town in Bend, Oregon. You know, the, the snow on the snow-capped mountains. You know, all the beautiful things in this world have all been created 
specifically by Jesus Christ himself. And that's something we need to know. We need to know that. Jesus, uh, he's not just our savior. He is our savior, but he's our God. He made everything. He made you. When you look in the mirror, you're looking at the creation of Jesus Christ. And, and he wants to be our center. We're never going to really know the meaning of life or why we're here or what we should be doing or our future unless we see that Jesus is the center of everything. That's God's plan, is that we understand that. And, and Jesus introduces himself as the last word, the faithful and true witness, and the beginning of the creation of God. Verse 15, he goes on and he says, I know, and what does he know? He said, I know your works which means that Jesus knows us through and through. He knows us better than we know ourselves. He knows me much better than I know myself. He knows you better than you know yourself. Uh, he knows us completely. <clears throat> I, remember, I remember in the Bible where uh, Jesus told the disciples, he said, all of you are going to deny me you're going to uh, be offended and you're going to run away tonight based on a prophecy in the Bible. And Peter protested. Peter said, no, 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 Lord, that's not, that's not true. He said, he said, though all men should forsake you, he said, I never will. Not me. And what Peter was doing was he was comparing himself with his, his brethren and he was basically saying, I'm going to be, I'm more faithful than they are. That uh, no matter what happens, I'm going to stand up for you. I'm even going to die for you if I have to. And what did Jesus say to Peter? He said, Peter, he said, the rooster's not going to crow three times tonight before you deny three times that you even know me. And Peter listened to that and he just, he didn't believe it. He couldn't believe that that could be true. And yet, what happened? You know, the rooster crowed that third time and uh, Peter had denied Jesus three times. And in the book Desire of Ages, it says that through that painful experience, Peter learned a lesson. And one of those lessons was that Jesus knew him better than he knew himself. And that he also had a great deal of self-sufficiency that he didn't think he had, but he did have. And this is part of what the Lord wants to work on and to, uh, to, to get out of us through this message. Verse 15, I know your works that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish that you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will, uh, my Bible says, vomit you out of my mouth. Now, I'm sure there's a lot that we could say about these words, but let me just make a few, uh, just share a few thoughts. Uh, Jesus says that, People are in the middle, they're lukewarm, they're not cold, and they're not hot, they're in the middle. Now, if you think about that, um, if a person is, is cold, if they're really cold, then what, what's happening to them? Or what do they feel a need for? For warmth, right? When you're, when you're cold, you feel a need to get warm. And when you're really hot, then what happens? You feel a need to cool down. And we all know that in temperatures like this, you know, in Oregon and Washington and Idaho, my wife, uh, you know, we watch our, our phone apps to see what the temperature is gonna be in the next few days. And I think this weekend, it's gonna be somewhere around three degrees in North Idaho. We thought we were in spring. About four days ago, it was sunny and warm and not very much snow. And then about three days ago, the snow just came down like gangbusters and we woke up to 10 inches of snow. 
and now the temperature is supposed to drop down to three. Yipes. And you know, when you're cold, you want to get warm. When you're hot, you want to get cold. But when you're in the middle, what happens? You're just comfortable. And you don't feel a need for a change. And uh, I think that's one of the Lord's biggest concern, and, and we'll see this as we go along, that part of the problem of Laodicea is that Laodicea does not feel a strong enough need to be changed by Jesus Christ. Laodicea is just very comfortable. It's just right in the middle. And Jesus says, I don't want you to be just real comfortable. This is not a time to be just real comfortable. This is a time to realize that we need the Lord, that we need a lot of help in our lives. We all need a lot of help. Verse 17, Jesus uh, gets to the root. In verse 17, he says, because. And as I look at that word, because, that tells me that Jesus is now going down deep and he's going, into, going to the roots, the roots of the problem. Do you think we need to get down to the root of the problem? How important is that? How many of you, anybody here have fruit trees in your backyard? Any of you have fruit trees? Nobody? No, okay, one, two, <laughs> confess. <laughs> Three, four, <laughs> yeah. I've got some fruit trees too. <laughs> I've had some die on me because it gets too cold up there. But anyway, I have a few, a few now. And um, I've learned a lesson from my fruit trees. Right now, my trees are completely dormant. They're covered in snow. And it's, it's going to get very cold this weekend. And what's going to keep those trees alive? When it's really cold, all their leaves are off. They just, you know, they look like they're dead. But they're not. They're not dead and what keeps them alive is their roots. It's what's going on underneath the ground. And somehow God made trees, some trees, so that even if it gets really cold and if there's snow all over the place, you know, their roots are down there deep, deep, deep. And so uh, the sap goes down into the roots and those roots keep the tree alive. And then when spring comes and the snow melts, then we're going we're to be watching those branches and looking for those buds and hoping that the tree made it through the winter. And then hopefully we're going to get some fruit. But anyway, my point is that uh, what is happening underneath the ground at the level of the roots, that's where the issues are. It's the root issues. And Jesus, in verse 17, is addressing the root the root issue. Verse 17 is so powerful. Jesus says, because you say, I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of how much? Of nothing. And you do not know that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. Now, I've thought about these verses a lot. I've read them and reread them and prayed about them and thought about them and memorized them. And uh, I just want to share some, some thoughts about this. Um, the problem is that Laodicea says something. Now, we don't have to actually say it out loud. Uh, in, in, I think it's Isaiah 14, Lucifer said in his heart, I will ascend, I will exalt, I will be like the Most High. He didn't go around heaven opening his mouth and saying, I want to be God, at least not right away. But he said it in his heart. It was a heart issue. Ezekiel 28 says his heart became proud and he became lifted up. So we don't necessarily have to say these things out loud. We can be saying them in our hearts. I am rich. We say in our hearts, I am rich. Now, I, I think this probably can apply to uh, physical material wealth. doesn't mean that if you have money that you're necessarily proud. Hopefully, you know, we're not if we do have means. 
but uh, some people can become proud of their wealth. But I think this can also apply to spiritual riches. We can, we can say, I'm rich because I've got the truth. I have all this truth. And we can be proud of all the truth that we have. Think that's possible? Sure it is. I am rich and I have become wealthy and I have need of nothing. And when I see the word need of nothing, to me it pinpoints the, the root issue way down at the bottom is, is, a, is not realizing one's need for God, one's need for the Lord on a daily basis. Need is a big issue in the Laodicean message. And Jesus is pinpointing a problem and that we don't know our need enough. Now, now look closely at this text. Let's just look at this and really zero in on this. Jesus says, because you say, now that word you, who does that apply to? Who is you? Is it, is it, is, and what did the disciples say? Lord, is it I? Lord, is it me? Um, if we say, this is not me, it's you, <laughs> but it's not me, then what are we doing? we are disagreeing with the Lord Jesus Christ. With the amen. And with the faithful and the true witness who tells the truth. You say, I am rich, I have become wealthy and have need of nothing, and you do not know. You don't know. Now let's just look at this. Jesus is telling us that we, there's something that we don't know. Now, there's a lot that we do know. You know, we know about the three angels' messages. We know a lot. But we don't know everything. Some people say, well, you know, I grew up in the church and I, I know all that already. I know all that already. But there's some things that we don't know that we still need to learn don't you think? And Jesus is talking to us. He's talking to me. He says, there's something you do not know. In other words, it's like he's saying that we have, we have a blind spot. You know what a blind spot is when you're driving your car and you, you can't see a certain area where the cars are because there's a spot there. Part of the car blocks out your vision. And Jesus is telling us that we have a blind spot something we don't know. And then he tells us what we don't know. What we don't know is our true condition. We don't know what we are, spiritually speaking. Now, it doesn't mean he doesn't love us. It's not the issue. The issue is our spiritual condition and our need to be changed and for more of Jesus in our hearts. We need more of the Lord. We don't have enough of God, and we don't know enough of our spiritual condition. Now, let's say that we look at this where he says, you do not know, and we say, well, no, Lord, you made a mistake. That's not me. Jesus says, you don't know, you're the five things, wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. And then if we say, no, that's not me, that's somebody else, but not me, then what are we doing? What was that? Proving he's correct. Yeah, yeah we're, we're proving he's right. And we are, you know, we're disagreeing with Jesus. Lord, like Peter. That's what Peter did. Jesus said, you're going to do this. And Peter said, no, I'm not. I'm not. And Jesus said, yes, you are. 
And then when Peter finally did it, then he learned that Jesus knew him better than he knew himself. You can read all about that in the Bible and, and in, the, in the Desire of Ages. We don't want to disagree with Jesus. If we disagree with Jesus, who was the first one who disagreed with Jesus? Ouch. The first one who disagreed with Jesus was Lucifer in heaven. He disagreed with the Lord. He exalted himself above the word of the Lord. And what did that ultimately make him into? It made him into a devil because he disagreed with God. Now, uh, I've thought about this a lot. It seems to me that so often we are afraid to admit the truth of our real condition because we're afraid that if we accept that that is us, then we think we're going to be lost. And because we think, well, you know, we, we need to be getting sanctified and we need to be getting ready and we need to be overcoming sin and we need to be uh, getting ready for translation. And so if we admit that we're really wretched and miserable and poor, blind and naked, then that means, then that means that we're not going to make it. And so we're afraid to do that. But let me ask you, are we, when are we closer to being saved? When we agree with Jesus or when we disagree with Jesus? The answer is obvious, right? We're closer to the kingdom when we agree with the Lord. And when we accept what he has to say. Doesn't that make sense? Here's a very, very powerful truth I'm going to share with you. It's amazing. And that's why I call this sermon uh, New Light for Laodiceans because there's tremendous light in these verses. Tremendous. And, and, he, and here's, here's part of that light that we have a, we have a wrong understanding that if we admit that these five words apply to us, that we're lost. But the exact opposite is the truth. It's exactly the opposite. It's when we realize our true condition that we're on the road to salvation. Uh, if, you look at the, if you look at the New Testament, and if you look at Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and you look at the writings of Paul, you discover something amazing. And that is that when Jesus was on earth and ministering and telling stories and parables and healing people, that it was the people who knew they were wretched, who knew they were miserable, who knew they were poor, who knew they were blind, and who knew they were naked. Those were the exact people that Jesus was able to help. It was the other group, the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the other people who, when they said, that's not me, I'm not in that condition, those people, Jesus couldn't do anything for them. He said, it's only the, he said, the, the, the healthy don't need a doctor. It's those who are sick. Those who are sick, they're the ones that I came to help. Paul admitted this about himself when he said, O oh, wretched man that I am, in Romans 7. Who will deliver me from this body of death? And him recognizing that was part of the, of the steps he needed to take in order to be healed by Jesus in order to be rescued from his sins. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 3, he said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. 
This very word right there, poor, if we realize that we're poor, Jesus says we're blessed. What about the blind? Remember the blind, the blind man who came to Jesus and said, Lord, and Jesus said, what do you want me to do for you? And he said, Lord, I'm blind. I want to see. And when he knew he was blind and asked for sight, Jesus was able to touch his eyes and to heal him. What about the naked? Remember the demoniac? You know, he was naked, wasn't he? And when he realized his need, he, he saw Jesus off in the distance. He came running over to him. He opened his mouth to try to ask for help, and the words of devils came out of his mouth. And then Jesus, you know, cast those devils out. And the end of the story is that he was, uh, he was sitting, and he was clothed, and he was in his right mind. His mind had been restored to him. So these words, wretched, miserable, poor, blinded, naked, are not words to fight. They're not words for us to look at and say, that's not me. The, 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 uh, the shocking light from the Laodicean message is that we need to agree with the Lord, that we need to accept that these words apply to us, and when we do, that's part of the path to healing. That's part of the process of opening the heart and letting Jesus come in, which is what the Laodicean message is all about. It's about breaking down the barriers in our hearts, causing us to realize the truth of our desperate need for Jesus and realizing that when we accept the truth, that's okay. It's actually the right thing to do. It's actually the truth. So the truth is not just the truth about what day of the week is the Sabbath. It's not just the truth about the beast or the mark or the judgment or the law. A lot of the truth that Jesus wants us to accept so that we can give the message to the world in the right way, in a humble way, in a loving way, in the, in the right spirit. If we go to the world and say, you beast, you know, you guys are all about to get the mark, but not us because we're, we're the righteous ones. You think we're going to have much influence with the world with that kind of a spirit? No. We need to realize that, you know what? The people that are part of the beast and the image and the mark, and those who get the mark, or at least those who are tempted to get the mark at the final times, you know, we need to realize that, that there's, a, there's a basic commonality that we have with all people. We have a basic, there's something basic that we have in common with everybody in this world. And that is that we, we all have a spiritual problem. And we all need a savior. We're all in a similar boat. We really are. And it's those who are willing to realize that and accept that and accept the truth of what the true witness has to say now, it's very, it's very humbling, but you know what? It's the best thing for us. It's the best thing for us. It's exactly what we need, exactly. Uh, I have come to look at these words, instead of these words being the enemy, these words are the truth, and this is exactly what I need. And, uh, and I'll be honest with you, you know, I, I battle with self, I battle with pride, I battle with self-sufficiency. I battle with the same thing that Peter battled with, where Peter said, if everybody else denies you, I won't. And, and that kind of an attitude is a real problem. It's a real problem. And I've learned that these words are weapons. 
Like the Bible says, uh, the, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through God to pulling down strongholds uh, and, and blasting through every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. That when, you know, when I have this uh, little voice that speaks to me and tells me how, how great I might think I am, you know, I struggle with pride too. Um, I, I've learned that I can, I can hit those thoughts with Scripture, that these words are weapons. Because the ultimate problem that got, every, got us all into this whole mess ultimately goes back to Lucifer who exalted himself against God, against Jesus, above Jesus, who thought that he knew more, that he was smarter, that he was wiser than God himself. And that attitude is what turned a shiny being into a dark devil. And guess what? We've all inherited a nature that goes back to the devil. We all have it. Now, some have it m more than others. <laughs> but we all have it in some way. And we need to fight that. We need to fight against self and against pride that makes us think that we're better than anybody else. And how do we fight that? How did Jesus fight the devil? With scripture. It is written, it is written, it is written, he told Satan in the wilderness. And so when you're tempted to think that you are more than you should be thinking about yourself, you can fight that with scripture. And I've learned that, uh, you know, that that's, it's a good thing to do. And so if I take these words and if I accept that this is me, I'm wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked, it doesn't mean that Jesus doesn't love me. It doesn't mean that I'm unsavable. It doesn't mean that at all. It means that I'm agreeing with the Lord, I'm agreeing with Jesus, and I'm taking the right steps toward the kingdom. Exactly. It's exactly what he's, what he's telling us. Now, in the next verse, he tells us what he wants to give us. In verse 18, he says, I counsel you. I counsel you. Jesus is the master psychologist. He's the master psychotherapist. People say today that if you think badly of yourself, that uh, it's going to ruin your life. You ever heard that? Just whatever you do, don't, don't damage your self-esteem. That's just not true. That's just not true. If you recognize your need for God and that you have a, have a, a problem that needs healing, you know, that's exactly what we need. And the great counselor, the great psychotherapist, the great... Uh, reader of human hearts tells us our condition and then he tells us what he is offering us. So I, I, saw, I heard about a little uh, sticker that was once on somebody's refrigerator and the sticker said, it was somebody talking to God and it said, the person said, Lord, I've found the problem. It's me. And then the rest of the little sticker on the refrigerator, the saying continued on and says, and then Jesus is talking back and he says, my child, I have the answer. And it's me. <laughs> so we, re we need to realize we have a problem and the problem is me. And we need to realize that Jesus has an answer and the answer is him. See that? I counsel you counsel you to buy from me. And he lists three things. Gold, white garments, and ISAV. Now, here's a question. If we're poor, if we admit that we're poor, Lord, I'm poor. And I'm blind. There's a lot of things, Lord, I just don't see. 
I, I accept that. I accept that, that I'm blind. There's a lot of things I don't understand. I need your help. I'm poor. There's a whole lot that I need. I have temptations. I have struggles. I have battles. And Lord, I really need your help. I really do need your help. So if we're poor, if we accept that we're poor, and Jesus says, come and buy something from me, buy gold. He says, buy gold. Now, if you're poor, how can you buy gold? Anybody know what is the price of gold these days? What uh, approximately? Anybody know? I don't know what it is per ounce. I don't monitor gold, but... Uh, how much? 100? 1,100 an ounce. Pretty expensive. 1,100 an ounce, price of gold. Now, if we don't have any... If we're poor, if we have no money, how are we going to buy this gold? Well, I'll tell you. I'll, 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 give, you, I'll give you an answer. Where, what do we have to buy with when we're poor? <laughs> Here's a good answer. Yeah, it says in Isaiah, come, it says, you who have no money, come and buy. Come and buy. I think it's in Isaiah 55. You who have no money, come and buy. So what do you buy with when you have no money? Well, here's what you buy with. You buy with your, your currency, which is your need. It's your need. And the more you know you need Jesus and the more you know you need help, then the more you've got to buy with. See that? So there's not a one of us here that is too bad for the Lord to save. And there's not a one of us, you know, that doesn't uh, have something to bring to God. The problem is we don't realize how much we need him. And if we, if we realize our need the more we realize our need, the more we've got to buy with. And what do we buy? Jesus says, come, I counsel you to buy from me. And the first thing there is gold. Gold. Now, the real gold is not the gold that sells for, what do you say, 1100 an ounce? I'm just out of okay, 1340 <laughs> Okay. Yeah. The, the real gold that we need is not the physical gold. Do your homework on this, and the gold that uh, the Lord is talking about is the gold of faith and love. That's the real gold. Tried in the fire. It's faith in Jesus Christ alone, and it's love that he gives us. It's love for him and love for the lost. And, and if we're going to give the third angel's message and warn the world about Babylon and the beast and the mark, we've got to have a lot of love in our hearts. We need a lot of humility and we need a lot of love so we can reach people who are lost, just like we are without the Lord just like we are, who have the same basic natures that we have, who are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked, just like us. We need that gold refined in the fire that you may be rich. Those are real riches. And white garments that you may be clothed and that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed. The white garments are the, is the white robe of Jesus Christ's perfect righteousness. And we all need that robe, don't we? If we don't have that robe, our nakedness is going to be revealed on the judgment day. We're going to stand before God in our own righteousness, our own self-righteousness, which isn't going to cut it. It's just not enough. It's not enough. We need Jesus' love and we need Jesus' righteousness. So the Laodicean message is basically God's attempt to shatter self-righteousness, to shatter our self-sufficiency, to shatter our thinking, you know, that we're just fine without the Lord 
and to get us to the point where we're on our knees, where we feel a need, where we cry out for God, where we accept our true condition, and we, and we realize with wonder, with wonder that the grace of the Lord is more than enough to get us into the kingdom. His grace is, is vast. Jesus knows perfectly how to work with wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked people who say, Lord, that's me. Lord, I'm blind. This is my problem. Jesus knows perfectly how to work with people like that. So it's okay to accept the truth, right? To accept our need. And then Jesus will give us the gold and the white garments, perfect white garments, and that's what we need. And then he'll give us eye salve. He says, anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. Then you'll be able to really see. And the eye salve is the Holy Spirit who opens our eyes to see the truth. See that? So there's a paradox to the kingdom of God. There's a, uh, it's contradictory to what the world thinks and what human nature thinks. It's opposite the way we naturally think. When we realize we're poor, it's the path to riches. When we realize that we're naked, Jesus can clothe us. When we accept the truth that we're blind, then we can begin to see. Jesus said, if you were blind, you would have no sin. But now that you say, we see, your sin remains. See that? It was very difficult for the Lord to work with a lot of religious people because so many of them didn't think they needed him. Whereas the tax collectors, the sinners, the publicans, the prostitutes, you know, the, the down and outers, the poor, the blind, the naked, they said, Lord, help me. And those were the ones that Jesus began to build his kingdom with, those very people. Verse 19, as many as I love, I rebuke and I chasten, be zealous and repent. The Laodicean message <clears throat> is not Jesus coldly giving us a spanking for being so wretched. It's not him just saying, you wretched people. That's not it. That's not the spirit of the Laodicean message. The spirit of the Laodicean message is a spirit of love. Jesus says, as many as I love, I tell them the truth. It's a message, it's a warm message of love to break us down and get us to open our hearts so that he can come in. Just like I read in the testimonies, page 186, the heart must be purified from sins which have so long shut out Jesus. That's what this message is all about. It's about Jesus coming in, coming into us, and he loves us, and so he rebukes us because he loves us, and he disciplines us because he loves us. He tells us the truth because he loves us, and he wants us to be saved. And he knows more than we do. He's the faithful and the true witness. He's the amen. He knows. So we need to accept this. We need to accept this. We do. Verse 20, Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and I'm knocking. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and dine with him and he with me. To me, this is the heart of it. And it tells us, just like it says in the testimonies, that the Lord's goal is, is to come in to our hearts. It leads to deep humility before God. 
it opens up the door for God to work for his people with great power. Great power. It will help to fit us for the third angel's message. It will lead to zealous repentance that they may be favored with the presence of Jesus and be fitted for the loud cry of the third angel. See that? This is what we need. If we're going to give the message to the world, we got to be prepared. And the way to be prepared is to give up self, to die to all the thoughts that we think and to surrender our lives to Jesus and what he thinks and what he says. Because you know what? The amazing thing is, is he really knows what's best for us. He knows what's good for you because he made you. Made in China. Made by Jesus. And the best thing you can do is to give your life to him. To open your heart and to let Jesus come in. And that's what verse 20 says. He's at the door and he's knocking and he wants to come in. He wants to come in and dine with us, which means like, you know, have a, have a nice meal. Uh, I'm going to be done in just a few minutes and then we're going to go and we're going to eat. Isn't that going to be nice? <laughs> to have some nice, good potluck food. <laughs> and uh, Jesus wants to dine with us and eat with us and have fellowship with us he loves us, and he, uh, he wants to come in to our hearts. And that's what the Laodicea message is all about. Verse 21, to him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, as I also, have over, as I also overcame and have sat down with my father on his throne. This is an amazing verse. And as I've thought about this, I've thought, you know, the way to overcome, I don't know if this is a word or not, the way to overcome is by undercoming. <laughs> the way to go up is to go down. Those who exalt themselves will be humbled. He who humbles himself will be exalted. That's the teaching of Christ. So what do we need to overcome? We need to overcome our pride. We need to overcome our self-sufficiency. We need to over overcome the thought that this is not me. I'm not this. I'm not wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I'm better than that. That needs to be conquered. And how do you conquer that? There's only one way, and that is through Jesus Christ because we cannot fight our own natures. We cannot fight our own pride. We cannot fight the devil. I prayed so many times, Lord, take the devil out of me. I don't want the devil in me. I want you in me. And the, we cannot fight this spirit of human nature on our own. It's too strong. It's too strong. It'll just whip us. Boom, 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 boom. The only way to fight it is to get down on our knees and say, Jesus, I'm absolutely, totally helpless. I have a real need for you. And uh, I, you have to take control. You have to take control of my mind and take control of my heart and guide my life so that I can honor you and do what's right and have your love and reach people with the truth in these last days. And we just can't do it on our own. But with his help, we can do it. We can overcome. We can overcome. We can be overcomers. And if we overcome by humbling ourselves and accepting the truth of what he says about us, Jesus says, look, I've, not only is it not bad for you to accept the truth of your condition. But if you'll do that, if you'll accept the truth of your condition, I'll give you my gold. I'll put a white robe on you. I'll give you my Holy Spirit so you can see. And then eventually, I'm going to take you. I'm going to lift you up off this planet. And I'm going to put you on a throne right next to me. Can you imagine? 
Lord, how are you going to take wretched, miserable, poor, blind, naked sinners and put them on thrones next to you to govern the universe? Jesus says, that's what I'm going to do. That's my plan for sinners who know they need a savior. That's my plan for sinners. I tell you, it's going to be absolutely amazing to sit with Jesus Christ. I will grant you to sit with me on my throne. We have no idea what that really means, do we? It's far bigger than anything we can imagine, but that's his wonderful plan. You know, it's kind of like the frog who, who uh, turned into a prince. You know that old story, that Aesop fable, when the frog realized, you know, I'm, I'm a frog, and then he got the right kiss, and then he turned into a prince. And that's what Jesus is going to do for us. He's going to take frogs and turn them into princes and princesses. Last verse, verse 22. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So my question for you is, are you listening? Are you listening? Am I listening to what the Holy Spirit is saying to us in his word? Hey, the Laodicean message is powerful. And the more it's it's experienced, we read here in testimonies, God is going to be working more and more. God will work for his people in greater power. You want greater power in this church? Then accept the Laodicean message. Accept your need for Jesus. Accept the truth, and you'll have that power. Let us hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Uh, out in North Idaho, I have a couple of chainsaws, and I um, work outside my yard, and I've learned that if I'm going to protect my ears with those saws, I, I need to buy a heavy-duty set of earmuffs, which I finally bought on Amazon for about 25 bucks. <laughs> Got all the reviews were great, and it really blocks out the sound. So I wear those when I'm out there, you know, working with my chainsaw. Uh, I've got those earmuffs on, and when those earmuffs are on, I can't hardly hear anything. I don't hardly hear that saw, and uh, they work. <laughs> they work. God doesn't want us to have earmuffs on when it comes to the Bible and when it comes to the Laodicean message. He wants us to take the earmuffs off completely so we can listen and hear what he has to say to us. So I hope this has been a blessing. It's time to to go. Do we have a closing song? Do we just pray or do we have a closing song? Um, We do. Closing song. Okay, we'll, we'll hear this song and then we'll pray. And we'll pray that Jesus will come in and and do more in our lives. Do more. We all need Jesus. Now's the time to accept him and to follow him and to get ready because big things are coming and we need that preparation and we need his presence as we move in to the final, final hours.